بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين سيدنا ونبينا وحبيب قلوبنا محمد وعلى آله الطيبين الطاهرين الله صل على محمد محمد My dear brothers and sisters السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته Before I begin I would like to uh, remind you that today uh, it corresponds with the second anniversary of the departure of Al-Marhum, a dear brother, a respected community member, our dear brother Al-Marhum Nabil Hazima. Uh, I would like to offer my sincerest condolences to his wife, Hajj Aliya, to his children, and uh, to his entire family. And therefore, I would like to ask all of you to recite Surah Al-Mubarakat Al-Fatiha on his behalf. Al-Fatiha. Three days ago, my dear brothers and sisters, we celebrated the birth of Imam Ali alayhi salam. On 13th of Rajab, Imam Ali alayhi salam was born. History tells us that his mother Fatima, when she was about to deliver the baby, she came to the Kaaba, to the Holy Mosque in Mecca. She did circumambulation around the Kaaba. And as she was doing the circumambulation around the Kaaba and having the pain, labor pain, she made a special appeal and dua while circumambulating around the Kaaba. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would make it easy on her to deliver the baby. As soon as she finished her dua, historians say that the wall of the Kaaba cracked and there was an opening big enough for her to enter. And she did enter the Kaaba. And she delivered Imam Ali right inside the Kaaba. Three days later, she came out of the Kaaba, having the baby Imam Ali on her hand. Now, obviously, this is a big deal. The Kaaba is not a hospital. It is a house of worship. So for the wall of the Kaaba to crack and to open up for Fatima, the mother of Imam Ali, to come in, this is first, first of all, it's a miracle. Number two, it is a sign that this is a man of God. This is the great patron of God who Allah gave permission to his mother to deliver him inside his house. No other person, history tell us, no other person had the blessings of being born in the Kaaba other than Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib alayhi salam. You may think this is a compliment for Imam Ali alayhi salam, that he was born in the Kaaba. It might be, and it is indeed a compliment for Imam Ali alayhi salam. But I want to tell you this, that it is also a compliment for the Kaaba itself, that Imam Ali alayhi salam was born inside the Kaaba. The day Imam Ali was born inside the Kaaba, the Kaaba was not the same Kaaba that was built by Ibrahim. And it, is not the, it wasn't the same Kaaba you visit today. The Kaaba was hijacked by the pagans. There were 360 idols placed on the roof of the Kaaba by the pagans. 360 idols. It took the strength of the arm of this man, Imam Ali alayhi salam, 
some 27, 28 late, years later, to remove them all and to knock them down all from the roof of the cow. It was Imam Ali alayhi salam who purified the Kaaba from those idols. When? When the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam conquered Mecca peacefully without shedding one drop of blood, the Prophet conquered Mecca. And Mecca came under the control of Islam, embraced Islam after it was a stronghold for paganism. The Prophet came to Mecca. In the middle of the night, the Prophet, the same night they conquered Mecca, the same day the Prophet conquered Mecca, in the middle of the night he went to Imam Ali, he took him from his house and asked him to join him. He brought him to the Kaaba. It was empty inside. There was nobody else other than those two individuals, the Prophet and Imam Ali. The Prophet asked Imam Ali to step on his shoulder, the Prophet's shoulder. In the beginning, Imam Ali hesitated and refused. Ya Rasulullah, you expect me to step over your shoulder? How? You know, Imam Ali has so much reverence for the Prophet. He revered the Prophet so much. Because the Prophet was not only his cousin, his mentor, his teacher, his leader, and his Prophet. And Imam Ali sees, sees in the Prophet the Messenger of Allah who is connected directly to Allah. And therefore he had so much respect for the Prophet that he had an issue with stepping on the shoulder of the Prophet, putting his steps, his foot on the shoulder of the Prophet. The Prophet insisted that I will lower myself and you step on my shoulder, I will carry you. By the way, the Kaaba was not that high at that time. If two people, two men, one would step on the shoulder of the other, he can reach the roof of the Kaaba. And that's what happened. The Prophet asked Imam Ali alayhi salam to step on his shoulder and then he raised him. Imam Ali went to the roof with a hammer in his, in the hand, in his hand and he started knocking all those idols on the roof of the Kaaba, just like Ibrahim did a couple thousands of years ago, when he took advantage of uh, people's absence from the temple, he went inside and he demolished all the idols placed in the temple. Imam Ali did the same thing. He did the same. He took a hammer in his hand, and he started knocking down all those idols placed on the roof of the Kaaba. And as soon as he did that, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed the following ayah. Say that the truth has come and the falsehood has been defeated. So, that was the turning point in the history of the Kaaba, that it came out of the domination and control of pagans to the domination of Islam. It came back to its original roots, to be a house of worship for Allah, not a place of shirk and atheism. It became a place where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was worshipped, and only Allah was being worshipped afterward. Before that point, pagans were worshipping idols. What can I say about Imam Ali alayhi salam? What can I say? I can't say. Honestly, I'm so speechless when I talk about Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib. Not because I'm a Shia. Trust me. Any person, any conscientious person, any justice-loving person 
whether Muslim, Christian, Jew, or even atheist. If you read the history of this man, you have to fall in love with him. You have to revere him. And you have to adore this man for the great and unique qualities that he possessed. There is a Lebanese Christian poet, Paul Salama, once said, لا تقل شيعة هو تعلي أن في كل منصف شيعية Don't call Shia people as the lovers of Ali ibn Abi Talib Every fair-minded person loves Ali ibn Abi Talib جل جل الحق في المسيحي حتى عد من فرط حبه علوية He says the truth has moved me so strongly that I fell in love with Ali and I consider myself Alawite, someone who reveres Ali ibn Abi Talib. So if you look around, anybody, anybody is touched by this man would fall in love with him for his great qualities, for his sense of justice, for his humility and for his bravery. No man was as brave as Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib. No one defended the Prophet ferociously as much as Imam Ali did. All the time, Imam Ali was the soldier. He was the man. He was the protector of the Prophet. Willing to protect the Prophet with his own life, with his own blood. Imam Ali alayhi salam was the most knowledgeable among the companions of the Prophet. And that's why the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam says, and most of you have heard this hadith, أَنَا مَدِينَةُ الْعِلْمِ وَعَلِيٌّ بَابُهَا فَمَنْ أَرَادَ الْمَدِينَةَ فَلْيَأْتِهَا مِنْ بَابِهَا I am the city of knowledge. And Ali is the gate to that city. Whoever seeks the city of knowledge, he shall come through the gate. And he, Imam Ali alayhi salam says, in one of his hadith, Allamani Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam alf babin min al-ilm yuftahu li min kulli bab alf bab. The Prophet taught me 1,000 channels, 1,000 channels of knowledge. From each channel, 1,000 other channels open for me. A man with a great brain, with a big heart, and with so much humility. In fact, when Imam Ali alayhi salam became the caliph, he ruled the Muslim state and when I say the Muslim state or the Muslim uh, country, it was as vast as 56 or 57 countries in today's modern political map. Yeah. Big country, stretches all the way from China in the east to Morocco in the west, from Turkey in the north to Yemen in the south, Huge country, huge, vast country ruled by Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib alayhi salam. But look how this man ruled his country. If you want to know and you get a glimpse of how this man ruled his country, go to Nahj al balagh and read what he says. Imam Ali says, Ala wa inna likulli ma'moomin imamun yahtadi bih. For every Muslim, there shall be a leader, an example, a role model to follow. Allah wa inna imamakum qad iktafa min dunyahu bi qumrayh wa min ta'mihi bi qursayh. I have two pairs of cloth to wear. And I have two loaves of bread to eat every day. 
Now, was it because he was poor? No, the man was not poor. He was the head of the biggest empire on earth. Why he would only keep two garments for himself? Why? And why he would not eat that much? He says, I just take two loaves of bread every day. One in the morning, one at night. That's all he eats. Why is that? He says, وَلَوْ شِئْتُ لَهْتَدَيْتُ الطَّرِيقَ إِلَى مُصَفَّى هَذَا الْعَسَلِ وَلُبَابِ هَذَا الْقَمْحِ وَنَسَائِجِ هَذَا الْقَزِ If I want to, I can find the best food and best clothing and wear the best clothing and eat the best food. I have access to everything. I have access. He is the absolute ruler of his country, the supreme leader of his country. He had access to the treasury. He could do anything he want. But he says, No way. I would let my greed overwhelm me when I see people in my country being hungry. There could be people in my country in Hijaz, in the province of Hijaz, or in the province of Yamama, they even do not uh, dream about having enough food. I need to be their example. I need to be their leader. I need to feel their pain. And therefore, I decided to lead a very austere life. Imam Ali used to give money to all poor. And there is one poor also he used to give. You know that who that poor is? Himself. He equates himself with the poorest person in his country. Meaning there was no special salary for the caliph. The caliph would take as much as any poor in his country takes. By the way, my dear brothers and sisters, the, fair, the first welfare system established in this world was by Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib. The tax, zakat taken from people was being distributed on people, on poor people equally. Each poor would get three gold dinars, three gold dinars. You're talking about probably 400, $500, similar to what our welfare system gives to the poor here in this country. Imam Ali would give every poor family three dinar. He has his assistant, his executive assistant, Qambar. Qambar. He gives him the cash and tell him, go ahead and distribute all this cash on those poor people. And he does. And after a while, Qambar comes and he says, I gave every single poor three dinars and there is three dinars as left over. This is the remaining balance, three dinar. What do I do with it? What should I do with it? Imam Ali says, give it to me. This is my salary. This is my salary. He takes three dinar. He equates himself with the poorest person in his country. He does not d designate any salary for himself. He takes cash from the welfare system as much as any average poor takes. And all people are equal. A very noble lady from Quraysh comes to him protesting that you give me three dinar and you give this former slave three dinar as well? Come on. I, am, I belong to the uh, historic, uh, 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 basically, class. I am, I am a noble person. You're not supposed to equate me with just any citizen, a former slave. Imam Ali alayhi salam, upon listening to her, he smiles and he says, Inni qara'tu kitab Allah. I read the book of Allah. And I did not see that there is any privilege given 
to the descendant of Isaac over the descendant of Ishmael, meaning all people are equal. Whether you're a noble, whether you're an Arab, whether you belong to a, an important family, or you're a former, former slave, it doesn't matter. In my eyes, you are all equal. You are all servants of God. You were all created by God. And he is, Imam Ali is the man who declared the main covenant of equality in Islam. What he says to one of his governors, people are of two types. They are either your brother in faith or they are your brother in a humanity. If you're Muslim, then you're my brother in faith. And if you're not Muslim, you're still my brother in humanity. I'm not better than you. I'm not superior over you. Those supremacy ideas are foreign to Islam. Islam says, you all come from one origin. Ya yuhannas, inna khalaqnakum min dhakarin wa untha. وَجَعَلْنَاكُمْ شُعُوبًا وَقَبَائِلًا لِتَعَارَفُوا I've created you from tribes and nations, from one single male and one single female, and I made you into tribes and nations, so you may know one another. إِنَّ أَكْرَمَكُمْ عِنْدَ اللَّهِ أَتْقَاكُمْ The best of you are not the most wealthiest, are, the, are not the most famous, are not the most white, Rather, the most righteous. This is, this is how you can be supreme over other people. When you have more piety. Not because when your color, when your skin color differs with me. That gives you no superiority over anybody. Not because your wallets are so big because they are filled with cash. That gives you no superiority over, over anybody. Not because you're more famous, you are seen at TV more often than anybody else. That doesn't give you any legitimacy to claim superiority over any person. Only if you fear God more than I do, then you're better than me. Only if you are more righteous than me, then you're better than me. Only if you do more good deeds, with God, then you are better than me. Otherwise, all those other considerations are nothing but false considerations for claiming superiority. Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib was a true man of God. He did not care about any wealth. He lived a very simple life. One day, a beggar came to him and asked for help. And upon checking with his executive assistant, Qamber, the Imam gave, decided to give him some help. He was really poor. The Imam says to Qamber, give him a hundred. Give him a hundred. Listen to this, very interesting. Qamber says, I give him a hundred what? It is just like you saying, I will give a hundred to the poor. A hundred what? A hundred dollar or a hundred cent? If it's a hundred cent, that's one dollar. If it's a hundred dollar, that's one hundred dollars. There is a huge difference. After mentioning the number, if you mention the unit, that makes a huge difference. The Imam alayhi salam says to Qambar, give him a hundred. But he did not say a hundred what? Dinar or dirham? Dinar at the time was made out of what? Gold. Dirham was made out of what? Silver. Each one dinar equals ten silver dirham. Each one dinar equals ten silver dirhams. The Imam says to Qambar, Give him a hundred. Kambar says, I give him what? A hundred dinar or dirham? 
The Imam says to him, to me, it doesn't make any difference. They all look like dirt. Give him what he likes. Ask him what he likes. Silver, gold, and give him. To me, silver and gold and dirt are the same. It doesn't mean anything to me. See what he likes. If he wants gold, give him gold. If he wants silver, give him. To me, I have no preference because they mean nothing to me. Imam Ali alayhi salam sometimes used to come to the treasury. There was a physical treasury, physical treasury, in which all the wealth, the gold, the cash, the silver was piled. And then it was time for distribution. Before distribution, Imam Ali alayhi salam looks at the piles of cash. There were two piles of cash, one made of gold dinars, and the other pile of cash was made out of piles of silver dirhams. One looks yellow, gold. One looks white, silver. The Imam alayhi salam looks at both piles of cash and he says, Ya Safra, or oh, you, the yellow, addressing the gold. Or oh, you the yellow. Ya Safra, wa ya Bayda, or you the white. Ghurri ghayri, deceive other than me. Do not deceive me. You will not be able to deceive me. Ghurri ghayri, attalaktuki thalathan. I have divorced you three times. Meaning, I shall not go back to you. That's the, you know, figurative term. When someone says, I, I divorce you, meaning, uh, there is complete separation between me and you. La rajatali fiki. I shall not go back to you. Do not try to deceive me. I will not be deceived by money. How many people can say this, my dear brothers and sisters? And if they say this, how many of us are serious about it? That no money can deceive me. No silver, no gold can move me at all. It doesn't mean anything if I am given one million, two million, or three million dollars. I don't care about it. Imam Ali never cared. Never ever cared about that. Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib was spotted one day fixing his shoes. Not even shoes. His sandals. There were a few ambassadors, foreign ambassadors, who came to visit Imam Ali. And his senior advisor, Abdullah bin Abbas, was looking for the Imam. He was searching for the Imam. Where is the Imam? Because those ambassadors are waiting, dignitaries waiting to meet him and greet him. So he went looking for the Imam and he spotted him sitting in one of the tents, fixing his sandals. The Imam didn't wear shoes. He was wearing sandals. Fixing his own sandals with his own hand. Ibn Abbas looked at the Imam and he says, Ya Amir al-Mu'mineen, O you the commander of faithful, that was the title of Imam Ali alayhi salam. All dignitaries are waiting for you. They are lining up in the other tent, waiting to greet you and to talk to you and have some negotiations with you. There are foreign ambassadors and you're sitting here fixing your sandals? The Imam looks at Ibn Abbas and he says, the Imam raises the shoes, the sandals so high. And he says, Ya Ibn Abbas, kam qeymatu al nahl? How much this sandal's worth? It's nothing. It's nothing. It's worth nothing. Maybe a dirham or even less than dirham. The Imam says, look, inna khilafatakum hadihi, this rain, you're so impressed with this power you're so impressed with the khilafa you're so impressed with in khilafatakum hadihi azhadu indi min hadha al-nahl the rain the power you see you're so fascinated with is less worthy to me than my sandals illa unless uqima haqqan aw adfa'a batila unless i uphold the truth and justice, and I dispel injustice through it. 
That's how much it means to me. Power means to me. If I'm able to use power to uphold justice and dispel injustice, yes, it means something to me. Other than that, it means nothing to me. It's less worthy than this sandals. And he means it. He really means it. Imam Ali was not a typical politician. He was not a political politician. All politicians, with no exception in the world, they always focus on their own seat and their own power. If they are elected democratically, their eyes in the, is on the second term. And if they are not elected democratically, their eyes is on their seats, making sure that nobody would take it from them. They fight for it. They are even willing to shed blood because of that seat. Except Imam Ali, he doesn't care. He doesn't care about Khilafah, about power. He does not care at all. He does not compromise his principles so he can stay longer in power. He doesn't care. He would stay in power only if that ensures his integrity. The minute he needs to compromise his values and principles in order to stay in power, Imam Ali kicks it, kicks it with his foot. He doesn't care at all about power. There was one small white lie between him and grappling Khilafah. When? The day Omar was assassinated. Omar said, I'm leaving six people. Six people. One of them shall be the Khalifa after me. There are six people. He chose six people. One of them, Imam Ali. Now, out of those six, one of them, Abdul Rahman ibn Auf, says to the other five, he says, you know what? I am going to step down from my chance to be the Khalifa as long as you guys allow, allow me to be the referral and I pick the new Khalifa. Meaning, we're six. The Khalifa has to be picked out of those six. So I, Abdul Rahman, I will step down. I'm not going to be the Khalifa, but allow me to pick the Khalifa from among you five. They all said yes. One of them is Imam Ali. One of them is Uthman. So Abdul Rahman ibn Auf, who became the decisive voice here to pick the Khalifa, he says to Imam Ali, I begin with you. I, sh I will make you the Khalifa, providing you agree on the following conditions. What are the conditions? على أن تعمل بكتاب الله وسنة نبيه وسيرة الشيخين. I shall give you the Khilafah, providing that you promise me you follow the Quran, the tradition of the Prophet, and the tradition of the two other Khalifa before you, Omar and Abu Bakr. What did Imam Ali say? He could have said, yeah, of course, I will. And he could have accepted the Khilafah. And then he could have done what he wanted to do. No one will hold him accountable. But the Imam was honest, very honest. He did not lie. He says, I agree on the first condition. I will follow the Quran. The second condition, I will follow the tradition of our holy prophet. But the third condition, I shall not accept it to follow the tradition of the two Khalifa before me. They are not better than me. I will follow Ijtihad Ra'i, my own Ijtihad, my own opinion. I, I am not a follower to anybody other than Allah and the Prophet. With all due respect to anybody, I'm not a follower. I'm not going to follow other men. I will do what my religion and what my conscience tells me to do. Abdul Rahman says, sorry, I have to withhold Khilafah from you. He turns to Uthman and he says, I give you the Khilafah, providing you follow the book of Allah, the tradition of the Prophet and the tradition of the two Khalifa. Uthman says, yes, give it to me. 
he takes it. And Imam Ali was denied Khalafa. Imam Ali didn't care. He didn't care. He was not even willing to make one lie so he can become the supreme leader of, of the country. He rejected that. He could have lied and he could have done what he wanted to do, whether it reconciles with the tradition of the two Khalifa before him or not. But he was honest. He was brutally honest. Imam Ali is teaching us a lesson, my dear brothers and sisters, that you see the lure of this dunya as much as, as much as attractive it is, at ma as much as this world is so beautiful, but it is not worth, it's not worth you compromise your faith, your eternity because, because of it. It's not worth you choose the most powerful position in the world over your eternity. If you become the president of the most powerful country, how long do you have to reign? Four years maximum plus another four years. That's eight years. And then what? And then what? You're out. You become... You become a private citizen like anyone else. Go and ask those previous pre uh, uh, president, former president, such as President Obama and Clinton. Ask them, how do you feel now? How important you are now? I will tell you, I'm just like any other citizen. Now. I'm just like I was a president. I'm a former president. Now I'm not a president anymore. I don't have the motorcade I used to have. I don't have the power I used to have. I cannot issue the order for the nuclear bomb to be going off anymore. I'm stripped out of all my powers. It's only eight years I enjoy that, and now it's over. My dear brothers and sisters, Imam Ali alayhi salam, in every minute of his life, he taught us a lesson. He was the most democratic ruler in the world. The most democratic. More democratic than the President of the United States. And I will prove it to you. In this country, which is a democratic country, you cannot sue a sitting president. Meaning, if the, if the president is involved in any legal issue, you cannot take him to the court as long as he's a president. Maybe after his presidency is over, maybe you can prosecute him. But you cannot prosecute him when he is at office. Right? Correct me if I am wrong. The president cannot be prosecuted when he is a sitting president. Imam Ali was sued. By who? You will be surprised. Imam Ali was the leader, the supreme leader of the country. He was sued. He was sued by who? By a private citizen. Which citizen? A Jew. A Jewish guy sued Imam Ali in the court. Over what? Over the shield. Imam Ali alayhi salam lost his shield one day, his armor, and he finds it with another guy who just happened to be a Jew. The Imam says to the guy, this is my armor. And the man says, no, this is my armor. The Imam now is the head of the state, the absolute ruler. He tells him, no, this is mine. The man insisted that it is his. The man says, if you insist on me, then let's go to the court. The Imam says, let's go to the court. They go to the court. Who was the judge? A man with name, Shurayh. Shurayh al-Qadi. He was a judge. When Shurayh sees the Imam coming to the court, he stands up. Assalamu alayka ya amir al mu'mineen Imam Ali says, sit down. First of all, don't stand up for me. 
Number two, in the court chamber, you do not call me Amir al muminin You call me my, by my naked name, Ali ibn Abi Talib. Outside the court, I am Amir al muminin Inside the court, I'm just like any other citizen. You do not address me with my title. The judge says yes. Then when it was time for him to preside over the case, you know the defendant and a plaintiff, a plaintiff given two seats next to each other. He asked the Jew to sit on his seat and he asked Imam Ali alayhi salam to sit next to him because he's the caliph. The Imam says, no, no, that's not fair. You make me sit where the defendant sits. There are two seats, one for the defendant and one for the plaintiff. I'm a defendant today. I'm not the ruler. I will go and sit in, at the defendant's seat. Again, the judge out of respect agrees. But then when it was time for him to do the judgment, he turns to Imam Ali, he says, Ya Amir al muminin or Ya Ali ibn Abi Talib, you say that this armor is yours. The Imam says, yes. He says, do you have any evidence? Do you have two witnesses? The Imam says, apparently I don't. It is mine, but I don't have any witnesses. The judge says to Imam Ali, sorry, since you have no two witnesses supporting your claim, this armor shall go to the plaintiff, to the Jewish. Imam Ali says, fine. The judge hands the armor to the Jew and they both leave out of the court. Imam Ali and the Jewish citizen. At the door, Outside the court, the Jew looks at Imam Ali and he says, Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah, wa ashhadu anna Muhammadan Rasulullah, wa ashhadu anna kawaliyullah. What a beautiful religion you have, Ali. A religion that ensures me due process and justice. Imam Ali says to him, but you know it is my armor. I give it to you because the judge, I accept the rules of the judge. But you know it is mine. How did you manage to take it from me? He says, one day after you were packing up, coming back to Kufa, you forgot your armor. You left it behind. I went and took it. And obviously at that time there were no security cameras, no witnesses, I took it. So the Imam says, fine, since now you became Muslim, I give it to you as a gift. Take it. I give it to you as a gift, even though it is mine, but I will give it to you wholeheartedly. I give it to you. Where in the world you can find a Jew or a Muslim taking a Christian president to the court, sitting president to the court, where? Can a Muslim now take our president to the court? And there are legitimate claims that he has been inciting violence in this country and worldwide. You know the guy who committed the massacre, the terrorist who committed the carnage in New Zealand? Do you know who he was inspired by? He was inspired by Trump. This is according to the manifesto he had posted on Facebook that he believes that President Trump is doing the right thing by promoting white supremacy. If there is a true justice, this man should have been prosecuted and taken to justice for inciting violence for promoting hatred, not only in America, but around the world. 50 innocent people were killed because of the rhetoric of this unwise president, because of his wild ideology 
when he called our religion cancer, when he called Islam hates us, he is fueling all this hatred against Islam, unfortunately. What is the justice that can uphold? If now one Muslim does what this man does, what the president does, he will be immediately prosecuted and accused of inciting hatred and violence and terrorism. But we have a man in the White House, the most powerful man on earth, inciting violence and hatred, and nobody, he can get away with it. Because, unfortunately, our Constitution does not allow us to prosecute a president who is sitting president. But inshallah, as soon as he comes out of the White House, whether soon or in the end of his term, inshallah, he will be prosecuted. And inshallah, he will be taken to the court and inshallah, he will meet what he deserves in the justice system for inciting hatred and violence in America and around the world. And trust me, I do not rule out that at all. You will see one day in our CNN, in the CNN and New York Times, a title that Trump is arrested and he is taken to the court and he will be, inshallah, indicted and prosecuted for his incitement of violence. My dear brothers and sisters, I shall come to the end of my presentation. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to support you all, to bless you all, and to protect you and your family members. Let's end with dua. Allahumma kfir lil mu'mineen wal mu'minat, wal muslimin wal muslimat, al ahya'i minhum wal amwat, تابع اللهم بيننا وبينهم بالخيرات إنك مجيب الدعوات إنك قاضي الحاجات إنك على كل شيء قدير وإلى أرواح المؤمنين والمؤمنات نقرأ السورة المباركة الفاتحة Again my dear brothers and sisters I would like to ask you to recite Surah Al-Mubarakat Al-Fatiha on, on behalf of Al-Marhum, uh, Nabil, uh, Hazima, and also as a salute to the victims who fell in New Zealand, I would like to ask you all to recite Fatiha for them as well, Al-Fatiha. <laughs> 